Thank you everybody for joining today. Um, I'm so happy to have two of our artists with us today and they will explain a little bit more about the artistic practice to you as well as uh, Pedro who will join only um, from afar so he will talk about his work a little bit as well but won't be in the conversation. Um, I'm also taking this moment to announce the upcoming panels which is really wonderful. Um, so in online programming it's always very hard for people to not be in the physical space and you know have an education moment where you can talk to somebody um, who's in attendance of the exhibition so we're hoping that by having these conversations with the artist you will understand a little bit more about um, the piece that they're showing, but also the general practice and how it maybe relates to each other and to the theme of the exhibition overall. So today is the first panel, um, which I'm extremely happy about. Um, Petro, um, Petro's work is mainly on view in Rijeka in the exhibition, but then Deborah's and Matui's work are both uh, available online to you, which makes us extremely happy. Um, we also had the big pleasure to, to show Deborah's work directly in Rijeka, so she is our only artist who's sort of playing in both formats, um, which was very special to us because it connected the two a little bit more. Um, but without further ado, I really want to give the, work, uh, the word to her to maybe talk a little bit about her practice and about this piece. Yes, hi, thanks uh, Amelie for having me today. Um, yes, so this is a still from, um, from my video work. Uh, it's called Zero Degrees North, Zero Degrees East. Uh, so it refers to the um, zero, zero coordinates. So the prime meridian and the equator. So the intersection um, of these two axes. And um, it basically visualized a, a fictional island um, where uh, all file documents, digital uh, recordings um, from photogrammetry models to photography, uh, to, to photograph, to satellites, pictures, and uh, some recordings um, that have um, a, a connection um, or resemble nature um, ended up all together on, on this fictional island. Um, so um, the work refers to the um, cyber myth, uh, I, I, that's uh, how I call it, because it's a um, sort of like fictional story um, about the Null Island, um, which is an island that indeed uh, is supposed to float um, at the zero zero coordinate. And in the real, in the physical um, world, it doesn't exist. Um, but uh, in the online realm is really populated um, because it, um, all the files that basically are missing the geoposition, uh, they are all attributed as zero zero coordinates uh, from the software. So they all end up together uh, in the same spot. Um, so through this work, um, I try to collect uh, all these materials and um, I yeah, I spend a lot of time um, collecting and, and searching for these files and also maybe trying to find um, the early original location. And then I basically recolors and puzzles all of them together in uh, this sort of environment composed of different terrains and um, weird uh, flora and um, yeah, some sort of like floating uh, mountains and, uh, and seas and uh, corals and rocks, etc. Um, so um, uh, I guess it's like um, really interesting relation to cartography because um, I compose this work um, fully from uh, from home. <laughs> I didn't leave my house because it was also uh, produced during the um, the first period of the pandemic. Um, and I was in Italy back then, so we had a um, really severe lockdown, we couldn't leave the house and um, for me the only way of uh, kind of accessing um, some other places was through, um, through my screen, through my computer. Um, so that's also how uh, I started to navigate a bit more um, on uh, Google Maps, on um, different platforms um, where I can, where I, I could enjoy <laughs> the side of uh, different places that in that moment I could access. So um, yeah, while talking as, uh, about a, um, the, the story or the metaphor of the New Island, um, this work is also a, um, 
is also aims to um, question our, our relationship with um, digital technologies and how they make us perceive the world that um, is, is, is really filtered, is not um, the real experience that we have uh, when actually going out on a hike or, um, or going to the beach. So um, the voiceover that's in the video um, also talks about how um, through uh, looking at these images or listening to the sound, um, they, um, they produce also um, in the observer some um, sort of sensorial um, input, uh, for example, um, she talks about uh, how uh, she feels the soil or how um, she uh, smells the air um, in this fictional place. And um, yeah, and also uh, the format uh, to which uh, I usually present this, um, this work is also <laughs> quite um, dual um, because it's I often present it as a video piece, um, so audio and uh, visuals, um, when may maybe like people can't really go to an exhibition space, um, but uh, the development of the work has also uh, seen the format of installation. Um, so uh, the projection and the sound and uh, also a um, scent uh, that is diffused in the space which was designed by um, sound designer Mele Berchers. And um, was really like a custom um, sand that was trying to uh, resemble all these different habitats and uh, um, also inducing in the viewer like a sort of um, familiarity or uh, recall certain memories. Um, because there's always the case with sand, this is really much uh, um, speaking to, um, to the senses and, uh, and, the, and, yeah, and the memory. Um, yeah, so um, in this way, I also, I did a more like um, um, digital mapping for myself by uh, indeed uh, being um, always in the same spot, but uh, trying to um, make sense of all these different data that I was collecting. Yeah, I think it's uh, what you mentioned before is quite interesting how it functions through sort of a, a two dimensional space like a screen, but then also how it com in, is completely transformed in a space having um, completely different sort of feelings throughout the room, but then also with a component such as smell, which is so um, unique in that sense. Um, maybe Matus, uh, you want to talk about your work as well a little bit, and then we can sort of come more into a conversation after. Um, Yes, hi. Um, so I'm really uh, pleased to be here talking to you and learning a little, a little bit more about Deborah's work. It's really interesting. Um, if there's a lot of noise in the background, please let me know because I'm at my family's house and we're at the beach, so it's a bit chaotic. Um, so my name is Mateus Montanari. I am a Brazilian artist and researcher, and I work mainly in the intersection of art and technology. And I am particularly interested in the ontological status of technology in its local and global aspects, and in topics like data valence, data colonialism, um, so my practice, my artistic practice is really aligned with my academic research. And I like to sometimes merge science and art, information and sensation. Um, and currently I am diving into the concept of techno diversity and trying to explore ways of shifting our current um, technology paradigm, production paradigm from something which I call from vigilance to vigil, that would be uh, something in the, uh, like vigilance is related to uh, hyperproductive about constant uh, behavior change and data analysis. And vigil would be something going towards uh, poetics of care and attention. And uh, this project, the algorithmic landscape project, it's where um, everything starts um, and I do like uh, an investigation of like different dimensions of different cities 
like series landscape, uh, think, taking into account uh, the algorithmic layer that composes those cities. And I understand that the, the landscape more than a background that um, where action happens, it, it's actually something in the order of action that has a, a several agents, different agents that they are physical, they are cultural, they are technical, they are aesthetical, and uh, usually with the algorithmic logic that we have today, we take one type, like one algorithm, and we apply it to everywhere, and we don't take into account the specificities of each location, uh, and that and that's one important point of this work because. Uh, uh, the project unfolds in, in three stages, and, and I do an investigation of with two specific algorithms that uh, that work with um, collaborative filtering for content suggestion, and and I use Spotify's and Google Maps algorithm, and so in the first part I kind of subvert them. Um, and I do a uh, performance in two different, very different cities. One is Paris in France, and another is Caxias do Sul in Brazil, which is my um, hometown. Um, and then what I do is after using Spotify for a long time, he create, uh, the platform created a profile for my musical taste, and it suggested me music on a daily basis. Um, so I, so to listen to those playlists and walking in these two different cities and I make an evaluation of the algorithm. So if the algorithm is right and suggests me a music, like a song that I like, I turn the next um, uh, street right. And if it, it got me wrong and suggests me a song which I don't like, I take the next um, street left and then I start to mapping out this uh, different cities with the same logic and I create a time lapse of all the the path uh, and these actions produce more than 10,000 images uh, with which I create like a database um, and then um, for the second part I take all these images and uh, I developed a new machine learning software with a different type of artificial intelligence that search um, in the images of Paris, for example, the most similar places to Caxias do Sul. And then I try to connect those images of this very geographic um, distant places from an algorithmic point of view. I try, uh, like the algorithm approximates the approaches, the, the cities. Um, and then I create these pairs of images of the two different places. Um, so with those pairs, then I uh, print the images with a specific technique on acrylic sheets, uh, where the pigment um, of the print stays humid. And then when I, I print one image in one uh, sheet, uh, like for example, from Paris and then from she is in another sheet and then I put them together and as the material is transparent and the pigment is still a bit humid, the image kind of merge together uh, and then it, merge, it, it emerges this image of the algorithmic landscape. And then I use, yes, those images. And then I use those images to create sort of like time lapses and different um, like images and videos and this project has had several different forms like I have the video essay, I have the still images, I have the moving images, I've done projections and it's an ongoing project that I would love for example to explore also in different cities uh, and, and, and to see what are those similarities and differences. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting visually because I look almost like this um, old photographies or have this very sort of 
um, vintage quality while being produced through, you know, extremely contemporary technology. So I think this paradox within them is really interesting. It's almost um, uh, seemingly opposite, um, but visually so striking. Um, I think was, which struck me so much with both of your work is that you work so much within that virtual space and um, how, how much you're able to sort of mine it almost very, very clearly uh, investigate how um, the structures there are extremely hierarchical or they are actually predetermined. And I think when people are not as familiar with the digital or with that, um, there's this, always this idea of, you know, the, the, the internet or the, the in-between as this completely undefined free space. And then once you look into it, there are this very clear um, logistics or, or um, almost infrastructure within it. So I think it's extremely interesting how we explore sort of how we move in this immaterial space and how that then affects our everyday life and vice versa. However, everyday life is also extremely determining how we can access a virtual space or how we can move within it and how our physical location has a direct impact to where we are online in a sense. Um, so how, how was that interest in that sort of non physical space emerged for you? Um, so yes, so um, as I said, like, um, yeah, uh, Kashir is the zoo, like my hometown. It's a really kind of weird city where people don't tend to go out, for example, to walk on the streets or they usually just like go from home to work and work home. And it's very, um kind of like square city all the the streets are linear and then when you walk it, it's a weird experience to walk on the city and then um i was kind of thinking like when i started to delve a little bit more into mapping and cartograph cartograph cartography um i started to notice this kind of uh, pattern throughout the city um, and then as I was moving to different cities I was kind of like searching on google maps like to see how what was the image that the street is created on the start like like this drawing of the city and I, I started to notice for example that in Paris um, it kind of reminded me a little bit more of like the lines we have in our hands um, and then how that was kind of like this big scheme that covered the space where people were are sort of moving and I thought that image was really uh, had like a virtual quality to it um, and then I looked at Kashias and I saw that all the straight line and I thought it had a, re a really kind of technical um, quality to it. Um, so when I, so now it really started on Google Maps, that's what, <laughs> what I'm saying. And then when such looking at, as Deborah was uh, talking about it, even like before COVID, I wouldn't really leave the home a lot because uh, in my hometown, there, there isn't a lot of use of public space and it was something that bothered me. So. I would go to the virtual to sort of like um, try to subvert it or experiment with different things and create this other a layer of dwell in the city. Yeah, I, I guess what's, what's interesting as well is how, uh, because you said you uh, started from Google Maps and then it was also really similar for my um, design process. Um, for me, it's really interesting to see how um, all these different technology, I mean, Google Maps, satellites, um, um, photo galleries, they produced in us a sort of uh, understanding of um, a reality or like a physical reality that is out there. Um, but like to which extent can, can we trust what uh, this, this technology is depicting. Um, so that's that's also been like a recurring question for, for me and, uh, and also um, in my research, I'm always trying to, um, yeah, 
um, make sense and make a distinction uh, between what I see and how I perceive it. But um, I'm also quite questioning, um, they might maybe not represent reality, but they are still real pictures. So it's still real material that is, uh, is produced and it, it will uh, impact us anyways, either if it's true or not true. Um, so uh, that's, um, yeah, that's a sort of like a, like a recurring question for myself also when investigating in the, in the digital spaces, um, how, yeah, how this, this, these things that we see from different perspectives, if you want for satellites, pictures, they were seen from above, from um, Google Maps, maybe we can uh, access the street view and we see the same street, uh, but also with different eyes. Um, so it's, it's also like, we also internalize um, different ways of looking that are not through our own eyes and our own experience, but through the technologies that they, they give access to us. Yeah, I think Deborah, it's so interesting how you very consciously sort of build a new, uh, literally new space or a new, you know, uh, landscape. But then if you think about what Google does and particularly their picture function, it is that we can travel to cities and we have clear expectations in our head without, you know, leaving our couch, what a city looks like, even though obviously it's through photography and what is most likely to be photographed. You always have this very one dimensional uh, um, idea of a space, but, and there's even, I think I recently read about the term, it was uh, um, sort of a depression that you have when you visit a space uh, that you've seen before online and, you know, expectation and reality won't mix at all because it mm -hmm. is on this virtual build of a space rather than it's, you know, the, the perfect, um, beach on a Caribbean island or you know one of the cities like New York or Paris that has such a build-up sort of in people's imagination at this point um, so I think it's quite interesting how you both play with this uh, within your practice and how you sort of uh, almost reappropriate that kind of uh, technology by really creating another facet of a place or a completely different place uh, while using tools um, that are so often used within our daily lives, um, such as, you know, Google Images and Google Maps and, and, and sort of these tools. Um, but have you thought about um, how, because it, it almost feels like those are really amazing tools for people to use as a social, you know, program of you would have more visitors on all islands, like digitally, if that's a, a thought, or uh, with a Spotify list or things, it's almost like a social practice where people could really walk and trace your steps or, or you know, use a similar methodology with the music within their home city. Um, how, how, are you, how are you seeing such things? Um, Mm, um yeah um i guess we are so used to it nowadays that um we are so used to um to go on google maps to um connect with people also on uh, on uh, on social media so like we always have this sort of filtered experience and um i think like we are really much aware of it, but um, at, at the same time, it's just become so internalized that we don't, we we can't really go back to the basis and and just just trust uh, our our own physicality. Um, I, yeah, like my my work happens a lot in in the digital realm because I will work mostly with my uh, computer. Um, I uh, I connect also with people on, uh, on on social media. I uh, collect data, but uh, I also have this sort of um, really analog way of collecting data. I'm not using algorithms, but I'm I'm collecting myself. And I think that, for example, for me, grounds me a bit more with the material I'm I'm involved with. As I think that uh, what Deborah is saying is really um, important. For me as well, I like to mix there's like uh, different types of reality. And I, I really feel like it's a mixed reality nowadays. Um, and then it, it sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense in some situations to, to have this clear separation of physical and digital, um, even though it can be dangerous, but um, I think that 
they are both different types of existence and then they have to be judged within um not just judged but like understood in their own terms so if i am taking um like the physical world and i'm comparing to something that uh it's established by the digital or vice versa it's obvious that those things will that those things will clash uh so i think it's important to have different ways to um to under to understand and to assess each of these types of existence but at the same time uh, it's important to acknowledge that they are intertwined. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then you can, uh, as Emily was asking about, like for you, uh, you can use the, the same type of technology to do something great and to do something horrible. Um, <laughs> I think just the the problem now is that the way the technology is being developed is aiming towards something that's mm. profitable. And usually that's not in the best interest interest of um, the collective. And then and then you you need to be a little bit like sassy <laughs> to work with it and to, to to make it work for you and for your community. And I think that's the key. Yeah, I think it has been such a shift when the 80s and 90s, there was this euphoria of this, you know, free space of absolute democratization and maybe collective um, reconnection and reorganization. And then we've very much seen, particularly in the last 10 years or even during the pandemic to an extreme, how ex capitalistic these structures have become and how they've enabled our societal system through becoming sort of another tool, um, which I think has been very disheartening for a lot of people. So I think it's really interesting how you sort of utilize that within an artistic format and show that there's different infrastructures you can use and how you can even work within the algorithm that might be provided by a platform like Google, but take completely different things out of it. I think it's very beautiful how you sort of um, build on that and then take it out of their, their context and, and um, reuse it for something that's so beautiful and so completely different than the original uh, um, format or, or idea. Uh, but I was wondering, how is, how is that your background um, when you went into fine arts? Did you always have an interest in the digital? Um, because from a, a, a non-technical you know, <laughs> non person, it's extremely impressive to think of the, the hard skills that you need as an artist to work on these intersections of science and knowledge production and coding and then producing these beautiful visuals but having sort of these hard skills underneath it yeah so i i actually uh studied computer science uh as a undergrad and then I, I, it was kind of like a, this weird actually um course in my university where we would mix like computer science communication and art classes um it, it's a really uh, i think it's like the only program in brazil that used to work like this now we have a lot more of those um but it, it was very technical and then um when i was um like in the middle of my um undergrad formation i went to portugal where i studied fine arts for like six months and that was when i really like saw the opportunity to um mix those things together and then i came back to brazil and then i did my masters and i'm doing my phd in fine arts so i i think that's i have this sort of um mixed formation and and also like the my program like my master's and phd program has an open curriculum so i can take classes for example from different um disciplines so i i did like some things from computer science and then i'm doing philosophy and then i'm doing fine arts and just mixing everything <laughs> yeah and for me um i i have a bachelor in interaction design um, so it's at the Art Academy. Um, it's a design course with a look on technology, um, but also really much um, open and, um, and experimental. 
And uh, I think, yeah, when I started studying there, um, I wasn't really familiar with certain um, technologies like infrastructures or certain systems. And then, of course, in a year, you get a bit more attuned um, with some sort of, yeah, also with uh, technologies and the softwares that are out there. Um, but um, I'm more um, interested in the potentials of uh, storytelling through uh, this sort of technologies. Um, so also my work has shifted a bit more towards um, a more, um, yeah, like a static uh, um, narration uh, again, makes use of digital technologies. Um, so it's always, yeah, it's always trying to also uh, find a balance that works for yourself and how uh, much art focus, how much storytelling focus, how much um, uh, maybe like, um, yeah, they can, uh, asking questions about technologies or our, our use of it. Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it's always about like re-navigating um, these, uh, these different areas and, uh, and always try to find like maybe the sweet spot um, where uh, within my work, I can ask multiple and diverse questions about different things. Yeah, I think it was really much this mixed uh, um, media aspect that really attracted us to both of you because it's you know a lot of people or a lot of artists are now working within the vit virtual re uh, realm as virtual artists or you know video works but I think you both have this approach where you think through these structures virtually but always immediately also think about the space and how to bridge that online world with sort of the real reality and we we talked about that a little bit when we mentioned that um and Rieka, we showed your work during the opening so we had a beautiful video work and then it has a, a sound component and it has a smell and you know it is installed within the room and it's very similar with um Mateus, where you know you have what you mentioned your prints and your videos but it's also a performative practice so i think it's just really interesting how you bridge the the virtual with the um, living reality of where we are and how to sort of bring the medium within then our our um yeah our our lives and to the audience because i think it's quite we've seen it with so many exhibitions where it's very hard for for an audience to come into a space and there's maybe 20 virtual reality works you know and you really have to have a headspace and spend maybe five hours to look through all of them but um with your work it has this beautiful thing where you can access it from so many different perspectives um but how, how do you balance that within your practice are you thinking about um, different contexts within the museum context or even um, some of your pieces I feel would work very well in the academic realm like um, do you think through these different contexts and while you produce or is it more that you produce something and it fits so many different hats in a sense um, yeah so for me it um, often starts really in a really intuitive way, and then I see how um, the same work can uh, acquire different formats. Um, but uh, lately, I've been much more interested in uh, exiting the screen. Um, so, um, in this way, in this way, also um, with the opening up of the cultural spaces, um, I'm really intrigued at creating more uh, installations and and work within the space, um, so that you can really have more like embodied experience. Um, but uh, I also, <laughs> at the same time, I really want to escape this format because um, much of the knowledge and the material that I access um, uh, for myself and for my own practice come from uh, um, from the online world, the online realm, uh, thanks to um, yeah, free source uh, database, like open source softwares. Um, forums where and tutorials so like much of my practice is really also about accessing um, the material that is already out there and is offered uh, from the community so I also aim in a way to uh, make my work as accessible as possible and um, yeah, and about this exclusivity of um, of the work being exhibited only in uh, in cultural spaces or museum um, because yeah I, I just think uh, because it also is also born from uh, um, from from the free space. I also want to give it back to to this free space in a way. Um, yeah, and for me, I think that well, my 
all of my works usually start with some sort of more academic research. So I'm looking into some topic and some type of like technology usually, and then I'm researching how it works and how, what are the more um, social aspects of it, where it's uh, like, where are the friction points of something or some topic? And then I usually start writing. So my works usually start with some sort of paper. <laughs> and then um, and then I start thinking uh, about different process. How can I take this sort of information that I've gathered and then do uh, a set of different process that will um, transform, translate, or uh, create um, different forms, usually, or different experiences um, with that, and how I can sort of uh, turn this information in, into a sensation, or how can I um, uh, even like produce something that even if the person is not interested in reading all the research, um, how they can still access uh, a bit of it. And that's uh, right now what I'm trying to um, <laughs> understand how to do it like properly. I'm very experimental, but I, I, I'm trying to like always have this uh, set in for each project where I have sort of like a paper I have the more fine art work and then I have maybe a video essay or something else where like uh, people can access from different backgrounds or like how they feel more comfortable with and then still be part of the conversation and then usually um, it all changes sometimes uh, when people like are reading and they get back to me and then I feel like, oh, that's a good point. And then maybe that will change my video essay or it will change the, uh, the more fine artwork. Um, and I'm really open to that. So sometimes it's hard, for example, with museums um, because they, they, they ask me like, well, okay, but what, what are we going to keep? <laughs> and then it's a, I usually make like, um, uh, a PDF <laughs> with uh, prints of all the process and like videos of how how it was, how it became, and, and a sort of like this um, history of the work uh, that I think it's interesting to keep. Um, and and I, I really like, it's not something that bothers me that it will be shown in different formats. Like on the contrary, I prefer yeah, I mean, it's something that we see so much with immaterial work, where there is this very um, strong concern about how do we preserve more time-based media in the future. And then there's also what you mentioned with museums, if they want to acquire it, but also with private collectors, you know, the moment that the art market is sort of involved, which of course is also a ne necessity, you know, we all want um, artists to be paid. So I think it's quite, uh, um, obviously there, there's a, a need for it, but it's also very difficult with work such as that who play on open access or who play on having a uh, changing work, what you mentioned with some of your works that are in a constant sort of development phase when are you saying this is a, a, a product or, or finished work that I can you know give away to an institution or to a collector or a gallery um, I always wonder how you grapple with that because it's so, such a hard decision to make and you know with sort of NFTs opening or, or flushing the market everybody was I think at this moment of ownership of non-material works um, which brings another set of, of critical questions with it. But do you have strategies of what you consider um, sort of more exhibition or institutional pieces, what you can actually put on a market? Um, how do you navigate that? Um, well, that's hard. <laughs> uh, and usually, um, I, it, it depends from institution to institution, um, but I usually try to have some, um, like during the exhibition, for example, if it's something that 
uh, the institution or the creators are interested, I try to um, show all the process, like with usually like video installation, and then we have print and we have everything. And then we, after that, we have like a conversation of how uh, the institution is sometimes how, how they are prepared to store um, a work like this. And sometimes they are not very prepared to store a digital work. So what I do is then I have a print, like for example, this image, I could like print it um, really large and then they will, would keep that uh, and also like would keep like maybe a video of the exhibition and then some documentation. Um, and then for, for example, for like more, um, uh, for works that require a little bit more of like programming, I usually uh, have like a document with all the code that is and with comment if like, for example, like in probably in two or three years, maybe this code won't work anymore and I will have to redo it or someone else will have to redo it. So I have all the logic behind it um, in a separate document. So it, they will be able to reproduce it in a different format. Um, yeah, it's really a case by case uh, situation and Sometimes it's hard. I, I, I feel like museums are more open to it, but for private collectors, it's really uh, challenging. So, yeah, I usually just like prints or like video for them. Yeah, I mean, I was laughing. I talked recently to a museum uh, exhibitor and they, you know, they have a lot of the neon works from the from the 80s. And they said, well, the company went out of business. That light color isn't available anymore. There's no there's literally no way to have a preserver have this unless you have a new company just for an artwork, which is not going to happen. So, you know, it's also physical objects face so many difficulties. So I think it's just a question of putting in the effort and, and rethinking what preservation looks like maybe. Um, Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, that's also why I'm, I'm questioning a lot with, with my work, uh, because it's also documents um, like physical objects. So there's always this question about preservation and uh, documentation, how to extend the life of things um, like beyond their lifespan, maybe. Um, but uh, regarding the yeah um, the museum aspect or how um, to deliver like my work, it also really depends. Um, I guess uh, lately my work has been uh, a lot about video, um, so that's uh, quite easy to just deliver a file. It's, it's much uh, it happens much more often that um, the final extra object uh, is a file that I have to deliver um, to this institution or to the person. Um, and, uh, and that's also very fine with me because I kind of really appreciate this, uh, this way of uh, not holding on too much on, um, on physical spaces to, uh, to um, collect and cover my work. But I can have just uh, yeah the, the digital file and uh, and that the format can always evolve from that um, prime source and then extend this, as I mentioned before in the installation format or in the performance format. But yeah, the file is always then uh, the the source, the original. I mean, I have to say is when we put the exhibition together and we're trying so hard to have a a neutral uh, carbon footprint. And there's a sort of double-edged sword, but on the one hand, it is so wonderful for install to, you know, you literally get a file sent to you and then that's it. There's no, you know, shipment, you're not flying the work around the world. Like there are so many of these benefits where you don't have to think about, is it really worth it to, to ship a giant sculpture from um, Central America to Southern Europe for two months? Like, is, how do I justify that? But then obviously also, and um, we constantly have to think about the footprint of digital works, um, which yeah. I thought was so interesting at the beginning of the pandemic where everybody was like, nature is breathing because there's no flights. And then everybody was on 10 hour Zoom calls. And you're like, mm, 
<laughs> so I think there's this really interesting moment where people sometimes forget these that you know streaming something um, creates incredible amounts of, of um, or needs incredible amounts of energy and data and all of these things. Um, so um, I think this temporality, anyhow, uh, was was quite interesting to us also with an online exhibition because there immediately was the thought, well, now we can do this forever. Like, you, know, you create a website, you pour so much work into it, let's have it for the next 200 years. So, you know, two years. Um, but also then to think about availability and how do you have it available to an audience and that sometimes having a time limit on something also um, sort of makes it more precious in a sense because then you have to sort of engage with it instead of having uh, something just available to your demand which is sort of the Netflix culture in a, in a weird sense um, so I think that's something that we were very conscious of when we when we put this together um, but talking about time is there something else you want to maybe uh, uh, know let the visitor know when they engage with your work online uh, through the through the website Or in that case, I would very, very much thank you for taking the time uh, to, to talk to me. Uh, as always, there's three more panels coming up within the next three weeks, but also please do reach out everybody if you have any questions to me or probably more likely towards the artists. Uh, I'm sure that they would be very happy to hear from you. And thank you so much for being in the exhibition. It's been so wonderful and we're really grateful. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having us. It was a pleasure and also for organizing this beautiful exhibition. Um, yeah, really thanks also for the conversation of today. It was really insightful and enjoyable. So yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really happy with our conversation, the exhibition, all this process has been really engaging um, between the creators and the artists and I really appreciate it. Thank you.